Same principle here with those hydrophobic and oilophilic properties. It will uh, have an affinity to take on product more than water, but it will also take on some water. Uh, you can get them for two inch and four inch or larger wells. Uh, they're ballast weighted for submergence and uh, they're designed to recover product, not water. And refills are very inexpensive, relatively speaking. Uh, so again, as, a, as an initial approach, hey, we found a site that has a free phase product. Uh, we don't know what to do yet, but the state or whatever the regulated body uh, says has to be followed and, and treated as a cleanup. Uh, the geosorb system, basically you put the, uh, the sock in the cage, you measure out where your product water interface is, you deploy the, the cage with the sock into the the, the water level where the product is and start absorbing product. It's not any more technical than that. There's no, uh, there's no magic uh, associated with that. Uh, the PRC is a little bit more mechanical and a little bit more precise. Uh, it does have a oilophilic hydrophobic screen membrane that travels up and down a, a shaft and the product passively enters through that screen and gravity feeds down into a reservoir. So with this technology, you can actually get a quantifiable product recovery and it's reusable. So once you uh, once you fill the canister, basically you pull it out of the well, you pull the drain plug, empty the product that's in the canister into your collection vessel and redeploy it. Again, pretty simple. Uh, the, the critical thing with this is measurements. Uh, yesterday in a session, we talked about interface probes. Interface probes are very key to success with these types of things. Uh, the trick, and we'll get into a little bit more of the detail here, is to measure the product water interface, put the intake, the floating intake screen at the midpoint of the travel range, measure that off to where it's tied off at the top of the well, and then deploy it. You want, you want the travel of the skimmer to move with any water table fluctuations, taking into account that they aren't going to be more than uh, 12 inches in a two inch well or 16 inches in a four inch well. Now some, some circumstances, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, uh, will not allow this type of technology to be effective. <coughs> Basic operation, set the intake uh, assembly at the midpoint of the travel range, empty the collection canister, pull it from the well, pull the plug, and uh, collect the recovered product into a approved container. Again, there's not a whole lot to elaborate on because simplicity can't be made more simple, but uh, there is some techniques that, particularly with this device, that uh, are important. Another passive device uh, that's been in production for well as long as John and I have been in diapers. Uh, it's called the filter bucket. Filter bucket uses the same screen technology that the PRC has. Uh, it does move with water fluctuation, but only as product fills the canister. This uh, this type of device holds two liters of product, and it's designed for use in sumps or in tanks or somewhere where you have calm still waters with a product layer. Uh, it will passively move through the screen and uh, collect into the, the collection vessel. Now just as an aside, you'll notice there's two different colors of screen. Uh, those two screens are a different mesh or pore opening. And uh, based on product viscosity, which is really key with this technology, uh, you would you would go with the blue screen with say gasoline or diesel or number two fuel oil. Uh, and if you get into something that's got a little bit higher viscosity, but not much higher, you would go with the green. The, the blue is a 100 mesh, the green is a 60 mesh. So just think of it as porosity. So basic operation of the filter bucket, uh, independently floating passive oil water separator. Uh, equipped with visual alarm inside the, the canister itself. There's a float, a 
attached to a rod. And as that product moves into that, that collection vessel, that float and that rod move up through the cap. So you don't have to constantly pull it out and check it. You can just say, hey, my, my bucket's full. Uh, the floating cartridge, uh, two liter reservoir. So when is one technology better than another? This is kind of where the, the nuts and bolts come together. As I mentioned before, viscosity is the key. And temperature is the variable as to how viscosity works. Uh, viscosity at groundwater temperatures of say 50 or 52 degrees are much different than if product uh, or water is at 90 degrees or 100 degrees. Uh, if you've ever uh, fried anything in a pan, uh, sometimes you can take a, a, a pat of butter, which is a, an oil. In effect, as soon as you heat it up, what happens? It turns into liquid. That's probably the best illustration I could say of, of visualizing the difference in viscosity. At colder temperatures, you get more solid. At higher temperatures, you get more liquid. And in most of the applications we deal with, we're dealing with groundwater. 50 degrees is kind of a happy medium. and uh, Definitely a uh, consideration. Uh, the screen intakes on the PRC and the filter bucket have a very, ne very narrow viscosity application. Uh, gasoline, diesel, number two fuel oil, maybe number 10 motor oil or transformer oil you can use those technologies for. After that, uh, you're not going to have much luck. Uh, you may not have a choice of technology depending on the product type. And filter buckets require calm waters. Um, the pros and cons of the PRC. Uh, the PRC will recover quantifiable product. That's important to know, right? How much product did you recover this month? I've seen that question uh, a lot in doing reports. Uh, PRC in the filter bucket has a limited application to gasoline, diesel, and light hydrocarbons. Well, we see in the consulting arena that uh, probably a disproportionate number of sites are dealing with fuel tanks, whether it's at airports or gas stations, uh, above ground or below ground. Something's going to leak. Uh, even lines that go from tanks to, to fuel pumps, they leak. So we're, we're commonly dealing with that. Uh, the PRC is a serviceable device. There are replacement parts. Uh, as with any, any product application, uh, it seems like there's boutique blends for just about everything and chemical reactions are common. Therefore, replacement parts are going to be uh, part of the deal. Uh, product can react with materials and constructions uh, of these products. The, the coil hose, for example, on the PRC that allows the, the buoy to move up and down the, the travel range of the rod uh, can become embrittled. If it becomes embrittled due to chemical reaction, that float isn't going to move readily, and therefore you can probably take on some water if you have a water table fluctuation. So just things to think about in terms of maintenance. Uh, detergents or sur surfactants can affect the properties, the hydrocodic properties of the inlet screen and allow water to pass through. A lot of gasolines these days, sometimes they'll advertise that they're a high detergent. That's a surfactant that could have an impact on the performance of the PRC. Uh, the pros and cons of socks, broader product type application, right? It doesn't really matter what the viscosity is, the thinner the product, the, the higher the recovery rate. Uh, it generates a solid or hazardous waste. After you've deployed the sock into the well, and you've collected product, now you have a soggy, wet, product laden sock. Now you have to do something with it. Typically, it goes into a 55 gallon drum. It's classified as hazardous waste, and then you gotta treat it as such as uh, DOT transportation rules and things like that can be um, costly. Uh, it's inexpensive to acquire and maintain. If you were to buy a kit with a dozen socks and a cage for deployment, uh, you're talking less than $300. So it's uh, Pretty cost effective in terms of acquisition. Maintenance, again, is pretty inexpensive. It's just what happens with the uh, material after you've used it up. Uh, and it may take on some water. So if you 
weigh the sock empty and you weigh the sock after it's had a, a spell inside the well, you don't know the proportionality of water to product. You know you, you're going to have both. Chances are excellent it's going to be biased towards product if you have the product to recover, but you won't know what that volume is. Uh, the deployment technique is key to success. Always consider proper interface measurements, just like with the PRC. Always consider displacement in the well. This is particularly true of the PRC. If you have a, a tight aquifer, you, you do your diligence and measure the interface and you go to deploy the PRC, for example, uh, chances are excellent you're going to displace the water in the well and maybe overwhelm the upper travel range of the skimmer and actually take on water. So sometimes in wells that don't recharge very fast, uh, the deployment technique is to deploy slowly, immerse the, the PRC canister, which is at the bottom of the assembly, into the well, allow the well to stabilize before you deploy it the rest of the way. It's like uh, if you fill the bathtub to the top and you climb in, you're going to have water spill over. Same principle with this. Uh, it's not good for tidally influenced areas and deploy to the mid midpoint of the travel range. So tidal areas, if you've got feet of, of water variance, uh, there are times where a skimmer would be suspended in midair, and there'd be times where it's completely submerged, depending on proximity to coastal areas, for example, or even along rivers, you'll have some tidal influences with that. Uh, some places, uh, the ground is very porous, and if there's a rain event, uh, one good rainstorm, that water table comes right to the top of the well. I've seen that happen in many places. Uh, some places, if they have irrigation, for example, and they turn on the pumps to irrigate the fields, the water table disappears. So the question is, is, is that okay? And more importantly, is that the right tool for the job? Again, you may not have a choice if you're going to go that route. Uh, we do offer a viscosity chart on our website. And it's kind of hard to read from here, but you'll notice two pink dashed lines running horizontally uh, towards the top. The uh, shaded in bar is uh, 50 to 70 degree range, typical of most groundwater. Uh, the bottom dashed pink line, any products that fall within that column here, are going to be suitable for the 100 mesh screen. The upper dashed pink line in between the two dashed lines, that's the narrow window of products in that temperature range that will allow the 60 mesh screen to be used. So again, it's a pretty narrow window going from one screen to the next. But if you notice the number of product types that are listed, and some of them are fairly common, uh, once you apply the temperature dynamic, that that narrows the band in, in which uh, that skimmer assembly uh, would be effective for product recovery. Does that make sense? Before you make a purchase, we do offer hydrocarbon test kits. We have uh, samples of 160 mesh screens, a little jar, you put a little bit of water in the jar, you take the product that you're going to recover, and you make a little product layer in the jar, you push the little cup into that product layer, and you see if the product will pass through the screen. It does or it doesn't, right? But it saves you from making an investment in a technology without uh, at least doing your homework. Okay. Uh, in summary, uh, viscosity is critical to te the technology being selected. Uh, decide if quantifiable product recovery is more important than just wholesale product recovery. Uh, the cost-benefit analysis of solid versus liquid waste disposal. Make sure your water table is stable during deployment. And that goes true for all three of the sock, the filter bucket, and the PRC. That is the presentation. Anybody have any questions? Yes. What would you recommend for like a really viscous product that's outside of those two ranges to the top of that right. okay. <laughs> uh, Very viscous product. What product is the best choice? Uh, 
I would say, given the alternatives, probably a sock. And again, that's 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 where we're forced to when you understand that the viscosity won't work with the, the skimmer type technology. Okay, great question. Thank you. All right, so moving from passive free phase product recovery, we're going to transition into the when and the why to pneumatic free phase product recovery. This is a category that Geotech builds uh, pretty well. We have several different platforms for a number of different applications. And uh, hopefully you see something that you didn't know we had, and uh, maybe there's an application we can help you out with in the future. I use pneumatic recovery systems. Uh, electrical power is expensive to run. And depending on the type of site, there may be some other classification issues, but uh, air as a comparison is a little bit less expensive to run than electrical ones. Uh, product recharge rates might be slow, but they are consistent. It's a good candidate for pneumatic recovery systems. Uh, the site already has air available. That's a that's a clever little bonus. If you have a site that has plant air or some type of air supply uh, available, and it can be branched into to uh, use for remediation efforts, uh, definitely a clever shortcut. Uh, sometimes you have remote conditions or an emergency response situation, and uh, pneumatic is uh, is a great. And uh, some some cases, very quick technology to deploy. Uh, we've built systems on trailers that are solar powered that come with a recovery tank, and basically uh, you can park it anywhere as long as you have sunshine, and you can recover product within an hour. Uh, John will be going into a little bit more of some of that technology uh, specifically. So if you stick around for his presentation, uh, you'll see some pretty cool stuff that we've been able to do. Uh, basically, there's there's two varieties of pneumatic systems we offer. Uh, one's a controllerless, and one category is a type that you can manage the functionality of the system. And we'll get a little bit more into that. Uh, the spoiler is probably one of the longest produced controllerless. Uh, recovery systems that we make. We uh, worked with a company called Keck Instruments. They had designed this probably back in the early 80s. Uh, Geotech purchased Keck Instruments when they were moving on out of business and we kept the technology but we added some of the, the uh, improvements that other product remediation systems we already manufactured uh, and moved those to blended those two products into something even better. Uh, there are factory default settings for cycling the pressure. It cycles about four times per minute. Uh, it'll cycle, and this is true of, of most other pneumatic remediation systems, it'll cycle whether there's product present or not, right? Once uh, once it's programmed, or in the case of the spoiler, where there's, there's no external controller, it just you just apply air and it works it just starts operating if you have product it'll recover product if you don't have product it'll cycle it'll still cycle uh, it's best suited for product thicknesses of three millimeters or greater it's about an eighth of an inch uh, particulates or surfactants will affect system recovery rate and performance and one of the key things to a lot of these uh, systems is clean dry air uh, particulates in the airstream, uh, moisture or oil in the airstream on these pneumatic components, particularly things that are controllerless, uh, it's a nightmare. So in specking in a system, we always advise that understand your air source. Uh, if you're doing it from scratch, we can definitely help you get the right tools to make sure that the, the airstream is clean and dry. But if you're tapping into a, a plant air uh, case, for example, 
uh, usually there's a lot of a lot of moisture, a lot of sediment, a lot of a lot of oils in that airstream. The zipper platform uh, is a controlled unit. Uh, it can be solar or AC powered. Uh, it does have its own air supply. It has an internal air compressor, so it's a 12 volt industrial grade compressor. Uh, it can be configured for single or multi well applications. Uh, you can go from one up to eight wells with this thing. It's uh, fully programmable. Uh, you can use this system temporarily. Again, I mentioned the trailer system that we had made a few of uh, as an example. Or if you have a, a long term project, it can be wall mounted and uh, can an AC platform. It can it can run forever. Uh, there are telemetry options. So if remote site monitoring is something that you're interested in, uh, the zipper platform can be configured for telemetry as an option. There is uh, pneumatic systems for just about every application. Uh, we have a, another product that was originally a Keck product as was the PRS system. Uh, the gas guzzler uh, was just recently modified to be encased in this enclosure and we've added a little bit of a control element to it. Uh, the gas guzzler is a double diaphragm pump. You essentially apply air to it and it'll hog out whatever you want to pump up to about four gallons a minute. Uh, it does rely on uh, uh, surface surface vacuum as it relates to uh, how much pumping head it can draw from. So that's a, a limitation. Uh, the PRS system is uh, very similar uh, almost identical to the spoiler system. The only difference is we've taken out the, the pneumatic logic unit and the pump and put it into a control box. So it does give a little bit of uh, adjustability and it can be manifolded for up to four pumps. So we've tried to provide several different options to meet uh, certain applications. Uh, the guzzler system is designed for shallower wells. It does use that double diaphragm pump. So it's a small industrial grade diaphragm pump. Uh, it's pretty robust. It does have a uh, high volume recovery rate of up to four GPM possible. Uh, it is variable speed to control flow rate. So when we put that pump into that control panel, we, we've added a valve system that allows to moderate the pressure, to moderate the flow of how fast it's recovered. Uh, the, the pump itself is non-metallic and offers uh, a pretty high degree of chemical resistance. Uh, you don't have to use a skimmer device with the guzzler. It can be done in a total fluids type application, uh, as with any of the other pump systems as well. Uh, the difference being is the, the other spoiler, the PRS and zipper. Uh, are going to recover small amounts, so it's more suited for product recovery, whereas the, the guzzler uh, is, is designed to move a lot of fluid. Uh, the PRS system, as I mentioned, is, is kind of an externally controlled variety of the spoiler system. Uh, it's completely pneumatic, so again, that clean, dry air it's critical to the function. That logic that goes into the spoiler is the same type of logic that goes into the PRS. Uh, it is programmable. You can manifold up to four pumps and skimmers. It requires clean, dry air. And the asterisk denoting that, that all pumps cycle simultaneously. This differs from the zipper platform where you have individual well programmability. With the PRS, it's all or nothing. So if you have a well that's 50 feet deep and five feet away from the controller and you want to manifold it with a, a well that's 200 feet away and 50 feet deep, you have to program it to accommodate the furthest away well, which may overtax the closest well. And the way to overcome that is all the wells get the same amount of tubing so that when it cycles, 
it cycles efficiently at that cycle time that it's being programmed for. All of the, uh, the pump systems for pneumatic recovery use the same oilophilic hydrophobic membrane skimmer technology that the PRC that we mentioned in the passive seminar. Uh, it has a travel uh, four inches in the bottom, two inches in the middle. Uh, the silver piece is the, the pump that's used with the spoiler or the PRS. Uh, it looks very similar to the pump that's used on the uh, on the zipper platform. <coughs> the only variable is with the guzzler, you're plugging the diaphragm pump directly into the skimmer assembly. And it will accommodate that product moving through that skimmer, provided you have high volumes of product to recover. Uh, there is something that we've brought on uh, probably in the last 10 years we call it the heavy oil skimmer. It's only available for four inch or larger wells. We also have the ability to configure it for high heat applications. Uh, we use a coiled Teflon hose as the bottom coiled hose. Uh, the skimmer itself is a skimmer to the degree that it's a solid block of polyethylene. So again, chemical chemical uh, compatibility is going to be pretty pretty key in making sure this is a good fit. Uh, the inlet is actually a small uh, metallic or brass fitting at the top. It is adjustable. So for optimal recovery rates, if you have a product with a higher viscosity than the screened intakes we offer will accommodate, and you have a four inch well or larger, that heavy oil cartridge might be a good alternative. Uh, an example of why we designed this, we actually did free, free product recovery in Saudi Arabia. And uh, as the manufacturer, it was requested that we come out and assess the situation, make sure we had the right tool for the job. And I think they bought, what, John, 20 of these or 12 of them or something. It was a pretty substantial number to justify going there. But uh, the ambient temperature in the summertime is about 120. The product was about 110 down in the well. And uh, the higher the temperature, uh, plastic pieces, particularly the coiled hose, get a little soft. And the product that was being recovered was a very, very light crude oil. It's almost like a, a cooking oil in terms of uh, properties. It flowed, but it was a little too much for the screens that we used on our intakes. Uh, that, that worked uh, optimally for that particular application. Again, we offer viscosity test kits. Anytime you move into uh, something that's an active type of remediation, uh, the price point goes up proportionally, and uh, depending on how many wells that you're manifolding or, or fitting with recovery equipment, uh, you want to make sure you have a compatible device. Uh, this is a good way of making sure that that investment will work. Again, the uh, hydrocarbon viscosity chart is a good pointer as to if this is a good direction for this type of technology. So in summary, uh, there's two main types of pneumatic systems, single and multi-well applications, controller or controller less. Uh, it's easier and has a lower cost to run air than power. Uh, some sites, uh, if you work at a refinery, for example, or a tank farm, Everything has to be what's termed class one, division one, or class one, division two uh, electrical connections. It's, uh, it's a lot of engineering work to get that done in a timely fashion and has a pretty substantial cost tied to it. If air is an option where you can move the equipment outside of that classified zone, you can actually run, run the tubes into the classified area and, and pump remotely with some of these pneumatic devices, depending on, again, the site conditions as to well depth and product thickness, things like that. So there are workarounds, and pneumatic might be a good way to do it. Uh, viscosity is the key to success, and uh, there are both low, low flow and high flow recovery options. And just as a comparison, I mentioned the guys will do up to four gallons a minute. 
Uh, the sipper, I think, is rated at 0.1 gallons per minute, which doesn't sound like a lot, but as it's uh, cycling four times a minute, and you start doing the math, that almost a thousand gallons a week. If that product is there to recover, that little that little sip of product over time, 24/7, cumulatively, can be a pretty substantial uh, approach to getting the product out of the ground. Uh, the portability of of these devices is relative. You know, uh, portable is one of those words over the years that I've learned that everybody has their own definition of. So, understanding the the capabilities and capacities of this equipment uh, will help you determine if, if that word applies for your application. Um, maintenance. Definitely going to be a key, just like we talked about with the passive recovery. Uh, there are things that are going to be subject to chemical reaction, uh, field handling, etc. Uh, we try to make these things as robust as possible, and uh, there are practical limitations to what that means. So, any questions? Anybody learn anything new and exciting today? The online, Brian? No. All right. So John's uh, going to be doing a presentation on the SIPR system after this this presentation. Uh, he'll get a little bit more into the details. A uh, little backstory: back in 1999. I actually worked with the design engineer that developed the, the solar sipper. He is uh, no longer with us, but uh, he was probably one of the coolest engineers I knew. He built it in his garage, and uh, it had such good application for remote railroad sites that uh, when he would come to the office here, the discussions turned into a, an opportunity to license the design and improve upon it. And uh, we still make that that product with his inspiration, if you will, uh, to apply to remote sites, and uh, works pretty well. So, hopefully, you enjoyed John's presentation and uh, uh, the applicability of that as a solar or an AC option. He's got some great examples of some of the sites that uh, these systems are working on. Uh, that he's been part of the design that I think you'll like to hear about. Cool. Did you have a question? All right, welcome everybody. Um, my name is John Scripter. Uh, I'm going to uh, Focus on uh, the solar sipper product recovery system. Jeff uh, uh, Nemo uh, uh, mentioned in his uh, presentation earlier. Um, so, um, why don't we get started? I got my contact information here uh, on the screen. I also got some business cards up here. Um, if uh, you have any questions for me, uh, you know, say a few days from now when uh, you're able to um, absorb some of this. So the solar sipper, um, it was developed for sites with uh, with no power, uh, no electrical power, or for sites where it was too expensive to bring electrical power in. Um, uh, we introduced it in the uh, year 2000, and it was used uh, mainly at railroad sites to clean up diesel fuel spills from the tanks um, and leaks from the from the piping. Um, then in 2011, uh, and that that system in 2000 was a single well unit, um, it would just operate one well. Um, we redesigned it in 2011 to operate up to eight uh, recovery wells out of one out of one box, and we'll get into that here shortly. Um, the applications: it's a product recovery system. Um, 
mainly for LNAPL um, applications, uh, gasoline, diesel, number two, and number four fuels. We can handle heavier um, um, oil with that heavy oil skimmer that Jeff uh, spoke about earlier. Um, we can also do DNAPL applications, uh, basically chlorinated solvents. Um, if it's something that's heavier than water, that is really viscous, such as uh, uh, number six fuel or bunker, um, that's a little bit different. We can't handle really handle that kind of uh, um, application. But we can also do total fluids uh, with this too. Um, and uh, the skimmers uh, will operate in two inch um, or larger um, ID wells. One of the things about a solar power system that you have to uh, keep in mind is the amount of power that the system is going to use so that you're able to operate it 24 hours a day. Um, so a rule of thumb is a one eighth horsepower motor or a load. It takes a, um, a hundred watts uh, per square yard of, or yeah, a, a square yard of solar panel. It's roughly a hundred watts to operate at one eighth horsepower. And a 35 amp hour battery will give you roughly around just below four five hours of runtime per that one eighth horsepower load. So five square yards of solar panels and four batteries are required to run a, run that same load continuously up to 24 hours. And the keys to the system design is. Um, the product type, the viscosity. What are you recovering? Is it gasoline? Uh, is it number two fuel? Is it number four fuel? Um, your well diameter, um, the, your depth to water, the product layer thickness. In other words, do you have feet of product you're recovering? Do you have inches of product you're recovering? Um, and your product recharge rate, uh, which is a very key uh, element for designing this type of system. This screen here talks about the uh, your recovery rate forecasting is based on a yearly time scale and then once a no go no go is determined uh, we use other information to design the system. All that means is we need um, your product recharge rate, the type of product you're recovering. And then we take a look at that and how many wells you're pumping from to determine how many solar panels and how many batteries you need to operate the system 24 hours a day. And expect the majority of your recovery to happen during the summer months because that's when you have the most sunlight. Next screen here is uh, one of the tools that we use that shows the average yearly sunlight in the US. And as you can see in the uh, southeast, southwest you have the most and the northeast you have the least. So um, a system in the northeast may require more than one solar panel and more than one battery for the system to, to be able to operate 24-7. Uh, uh, whereas in the southwest, you can get by with uh, with one solar panel uh, and one battery, depending on how many wells you're operating and how many times you're cycling that well a day. This uh, screen here is just something that also that we use uh, and it's um, basically just a summary of, uh, OK, your product recharge is, say, a gallon um, per an eight hour period. Um, it gives a, uh, an example of uh, your vacuum time, the pressure time, and the delay time, and how many uh, um, how many times you're going to be cycling the unit in an hour. And we'll base that on how many solar panels you need and how many batteries you need. We try to keep the uh, uh, the efficiency of the system to be less than 50%. So you use less than 50% of the available power um, before you need to bump up to add additional solar panels and additional batteries. Um, if you go over that 50% is when you need to have additional uh, power available, additional panels available uh, to give you additional power. These are the system components. Uh, you got the solar panel uh, here on the left hand side, the, uh, the control panel uh, that can operate up to eight wells in the center. And then the uh, you see these skimmers and the pump. Um, the skimmers are very uh, are the exact same skimmers that uh, Jeff Nemo showed you in the passive and in the pneumatic um, systems. Uh, the difference in uh, the pump here is the uh, this is an empty canister. There's no bladder in there. There's no moving parts. In there. There's no floats. Nothing. Um, so with the, there's just a check valve at the top and a check disc at the bottom. So um, it's very uh, maintenance free. Um, 
And uh, like I said, it doesn't have a bladder in there, so there's no moving parts. An installation diagram here just shows, uh, you know, if you have the uh, uh, control panel here uh, with the solar panel and battery. Um, we supply the system with a high tank, tank full probe that will shut the system down if the recovery tank gets full. Uh, and we're operating two wells here, and uh, um, this is a, a blow up of the, uh, of the skimmer itself. Um, with the uh, um, the screen and the and the product layer, and you notice that the way this unit floats is um, the skimmer is weighted uh, so that it will sink and product and float at the oil water interface. So if you have two feet of product in the well, it's going to sink down to the and float at the oil water interface. So when you're deploying this unit in the well, you want to you want your measurement with your interface probe to be your depth to water measurement, not your depth to product because it's not going to float at the product layer, it's going to float at the water layer. And the reason for that is so they can skim all of the product off of the top of the water down to a sheen. Specifications, uh, the uh, um, capacity of the pump is 0 0.2, 2 tenths of a gallon. Um, we can operate up to close to 200 feet depth. Um, the system, the controller has a built-in air compressor. That air compressor can produce up to 20 inches of uh, mercury on the vacuum side and overcome 100 psi on the uh, on the pressure side. Um, the skimmer is the oil oilophilic hydrophobic screen uh, that you learned about earlier, um, and a single solar panel um, is 100 watt uh, with a 16 uh, volt DC operating voltage, and the multi well controller can operate up to eight wells. We provide air and discharge line tubing, um, different materials depending on what you're recovering. Um, most common is the poly for the uh, for the airline and a gasoline resistant rubber hose on the discharge. Uh, we provide the system with a desiccant dryer because there are solenoid valves inside the control panel. They have to, uh, so we have to keep the air um, clean and dry so that um, you don't uh, uh, gum up the uh, solenoid valves. Uh, we can provide 55 gallon uh, steel product drums. Um, uh, the battery is a uh, 104 amp hour uh, deep cycle glass mat battery. Um, we provide kits for mounting the uh, controller and the solar panels on the wall or, or on a pole. We can do a trailer mounted configuration and uh, custom configurations of multi multiple batteries and panels, depending again on your, how often you're cycling the system, the, the product you're recovering and, and, and the location that you're at. This is the controller here. Um, on the uh, inside door, uh, there is a, a key for uh, setting the system. There's a four, uh, four pad keypad on the on the door of the control panel here that you use to set the timer settings. And the way the system operates is you have a, a vacuum setting that draws product through the skimmer into the pump. And then a pressure setting that pressurizes the pump and pushes the product to the surface and a delay and the delay would match what your product recharge rate is in that particular well. And those are set using the, the keypad here and then there's a, uh, um, I think I've got this highlighted. Yeah, there's a, a, a flow chart that uh, steps you through on how to make those settings. It's very, very easy to do. As I uh, touched on earlier, the compressor operates on timers. Uh, so there's, there's no switches, there's no uh, electricity going down the well. Um, you're actually uh, setting the timers on when the compressor is going to turn on, and when it's going to back, and when it's going to pressure, and when it's going to shut down. And your timer settings can be different for each well. So if you've got well number one that's producing uh, a lot more product, has two feet of product in the well, and well number two only has a couple of inches, you're going to want to cycle well number one faster than you do well number two. So you can set the timers different for each well. So as I mentioned, each pump cycle, you can produce up to two, uh, two tenths of a gallon. That's if the pump is full. And in a two inch well, that equates to 14 inches of product. 14 inches of product sounds like a lot, but it's only two tenths of a gallon. And so yet, and if it recharges, that's when you would set the system to cycle again. And a four inch well has three and a half inches of product. So your product recharge rate is really key in determining your delay setting and optimizing your control. 
um, what you want to try to avoid doing is to pump all the product out on each cycle because what can happen there is you break the, uh, the connectivity for more product to actually come into the well. And if you overcycle the well, you pump it uh, too fast and you pump all the product out uh, time and time again, eventually you're going to pump nothing but water. So I've got an example here that I put together um, uh, for doing the timer settings. You've got a four inch well with six inches of product, it's gasoline. Your depth of water is 10 feet. The length of your airline is 25 feet and the length of your discharge is also 25 feet. Um, we determined that the product recharge rate is six inches every two hours. So based on that, we'll set the vacuum timer at five seconds, the pressure at 30 seconds and the delay timer at two hours. And the reason for that is you got a shallow uh, depth of water. You're only 10 feet of water. Um, so it's only going to take, it's not going to take long for you to fill the pump up. You got a short tubing run, only 25 feet. Um, and so that five seconds of vacuum is going to fill the pump up or close to fill, close to filling the pump up. Uh, and the recharge rate was established at two hours. So we're going to set that delay at two hours so that we only cycle it when the well recharges again. So based on that example, um, and this is in the manual, there's uh, additional rules that apply. So for every additional 25 feet of airline, you want to add two seconds of vacuum and three seconds to the pressure timer. For every 25 uh, additional 25 feet of pump depth, again, it's two inches or two seconds to the vacuum and three seconds to the pressure timers. And so what I got here are some pictures of uh, of different sites that we've uh, installed these systems on. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Hobenza refinery in St. Croix. Uh, we've got 15 of these systems um, throughout the refinery and they're all mounted on a pole. You can see that the solar panel is mounted on the very top. Uh, we've got the control panel underneath it and then a box with the battery in it um, to help protect uh, from the elements. Uh, very interesting uh, at this particular site, um, everything is bolted down but someone came in and stole all the batteries. So they, they've, uh, um, they've tried to lock things up to keep that, to keep that kind of thing from happening. Um, so they're recovering uh, like a mixture of gasoline and diesel. It's, it's a refinery. So, uh, and they've, uh, we've had this system there since uh, 2012. So. This next uh, option is uh, we can provide the system in a, uh, in a hazmat enclosure. Um, basically with two 55 gallon drums um, on the inside with secondary containment. Uh, the control panel is mounted on the outside of the exterior with the, uh, uh, the battery box underneath it and then the solar panel uh, uh, right next to it. Um, with a system like this, you can drop everything on site. Um, there's four wires to attach, um, two to the battery, two to the uh, solar panel. Um, you drop your pumps in the well and you're up and running in a half an hour. We also have a trailer mounted option uh, that we that we built for uh, some customers that uh, rather because they have such a large site rather than have the control panel mounted uh, in a central location and then run tubing to the each to the individual wells, um, they pull up to a well well or, or, or a cluster of wells depending on uh, what the site is like. They'll deploy the pumps, set it up, and let it run for a few days to um, evacuate the product from the wells. Then they'll move it to another part of the site. So with this system, we have a. Uh, um, oh, hit the wrong button here. We got the control panel mounted. Um, we got the solar panel also mounted, uh, and then it comes with a. Uh, I think that's like a 200 gallon uh, uh, product recovery uh, tank, uh, storage tank. All mounted on a on a trailer that's uh, I think five by ten or six by ten, um, and fully uh, fully automated. So uh, I went through that in less than 20, 20 minutes. Uh, any uh, and I went through that pretty kind of quickly. Uh, any questions? Um, it looked like in all those pictures the control box was pretty close to the solar panel. Can you? You know, say you could sunlight on one side of the building, 
put your wells over here can you kind of set it up to where it's you know you get optimal sunlight on the solar panel yes you can do that um okay. the reason we we the solar panel comes with 25 feet of cable okay. um to try to keep it uh, close to the uh, the control panel but if you're at a larger distance we would just uh, increase the size of the uh, of the, the cable size the gauge of the cable size so you don't have any uh, any voltage loss going into okay. the control panel so if you had a really shallow situation high conductivity what would be the maximum flow rate you can get per day if you have the recharge, um, you can recover up to 50 gallons a day um, with with the solar server. Again, that depends on you know if you've got the uh, the recharge to be able to, to do that, um, and the site conditions to be able to do that. But it can pop up to 50 gallons per day. Jeff, does all the product move through that screen, or how does it? How does it accommodate higher volume of the product? All the product does, it moves through that screen and um, through the coil tubing and up the center pipe into the pump itself. So if you're if you have a, a higher higher flow rate that you need, um, we could do it with a uh, either take the skimmer off and do like a total fluid setup with a connectivity sensor using like a drop tube uh, so it doesn't have the restriction from the uh, um, from the skimmer and, and the, and the um, coil tubing here um, to recover faster so it has a water sensing option there is a water there is a water sensing option the connectivity sensing option we can put in the pump that's at the very base of the pump and what that uh, the way that operates is is as you're drawing um, fluid into the pump itself if it senses that it's conductive that it's water it will immediately switch from the vacuum to pressure to evacuate the pump so you don't fill your recovery tank up with water so it doesn't shut the system down it just evacuates the pump and then starts uh, goes to the delay then once that delay time has uh, elapsed then it will go through the, the vacuum pressure cycle again and I should mention on that delay um, that can be set um, as little as a few seconds all the way up to 24 hours so if you have a, a well that is a very slow has a very slow recharge you can set up so it only cycles as little as once a day so it's very uh, very flexible as far as that goes anything online Brian I asked if anybody had any questions Anything else? Any other questions? All right, if you want to take a quick break, I'm going to be uh, going through uh, the telemetry portion um, for this system, what you, what, uh, what you can do uh, um, to remotely monitor um, the system. And thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Right. All right. Well, welcome back. Um, what I'm going to go through here is uh, uh, the remote monitoring um, system, um, specifically for the solar tipper um, product recovery system that uh, we just uh, talked about. So the applications for our uh, site view remote monitoring are um, for remediation equipment. Is uh, you know, our, obviously our product recovery systems, um, water pumping systems total fluid systems and uh, SD and air SPARGE systems. Um, we can set up, uh, you know, the control panel um, and site view to monitor any of these systems. The advantages for remote monitoring are, you know, it's easy access uh, to the site, you know, especially sites where you have to go through, uh, um, you know, a check-in process or it can be cumbersome to actually get on the site or if you need to have a, uh, uh, someone to uh, walk you through the site um, you're able to do this from your office rather than actually go and visit the site um, it saves on uh, time it saves on uh, you know personnel travel costs um, you get notification when the system uh, has, has uh, had a failure uh, an alarm condition um, 
rather than showing up at the site like on your uh, whether it's a weekly schedule or a monthly schedule and found out that the system has been off um, you know it had shut down an hour after you left and has been off the entire time until you got back um, you know what to expect when you're going to do your uh, scheduled site visit um, rather than going there and uh, determining okay I, the tank is now full and so I need to get a back truck out here, empty the tank, and you may have to reschedule when you go back out there. Um, you can bring the correct tools with you to do the repair uh, or to restart the system, depending on what the um, what the failure was. And you can also uh, modify the system operational settings. The telemetry is a cellular-based uh, modem uh, or radio that goes into the control panel. Um, that allows you for monitoring the system remotely and also gives you an indication that uh, a dial out or, or a text message uh, when the system shuts down for any of the uh, system alarms. You can log into the site from, uh, from your, uh, your laptop, um, your desktop, uh, your cell phone or your uh, um, uh, tablet. And the system also has data logging uh, capabilities. With the remote monitoring, you can check the status of the system, uh, what's going on with it right now. Um, you can take a look at the uh, the configuration settings, um, like with the SIPR system. Um, you have an indication of okay, what are what are the vacuum, the pressure, and the delay settings, or what are, what are they currently set at? Um, and you can monitor any data that uh, that you're logging, um, so you can reduce or optimize your site visits based on based on that information. On the alarm dial out, um, on any kind of a system alarm, whether it's a uh, with a slipper system, a tangle alarm, uh, or you get a, uh, a water infiltration into the system, that kind of an alarm, you can choose to get a text message, um, and you can have that text message sent to multiple personnel. You can set it up uh, so that uh, I think up to ten people can get an uh, indication when the system shuts down. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, that allows you to schedule a productive site visit. Um, so you know when the system is down, um, instead of waiting until next week to go out there, you may choose to go out there tomorrow and you know what to expect, you know what you need to do um, when you get to the site. The system settings, um, these are a, a, another function that you can make adjustments to uh, with, the, with the site view. Um, you can adjust the dial-up settings, you can add uh, users, you can add uh, people that you want to get uh, um, indications when the system shuts down. You can also make changes to the uh, system configuration. Um, I'll, I'll show you that here um, uh, momentarily. Uh, and as mentioned, you can add users um, uh, as uh, you get maybe turnover with employees or, or some. You got a, a different project manager that's uh, monitoring that site. A different uh, field tech is now taking care of that site. You can add them in and add their contact information in so that they get uh, indications when the system is shut down. And uh, can also log in and do some monitoring to the system as well. So I'm gonna log on to a site here. Um, this particular site is in, a, uh, um, it's in Syracuse, New York. Um, it's a solar sipper system that is uh, uh, operating up to eight recovery wells. Let's click on the uh, controller here. We have a guest here. All right, so this screen here, this is like the, the dashboard that shows you the, uh, you know, what the, the system voltage is, the battery is, is fully charged, um, uh, the temperature basically at, at the site right now, um, and some indication on the, uh, uh, on the telemetry on the radio itself. And it can also tell you um, if you have a fault on any of the alarms. Uh, right now, uh, they say OK. If they're in alarm, it's going to show you in red. So uh, we've got um, this screen here tells you that well number three is currently the active well. Um, it's going through its delay cycle, and then it will go through and, and do a vacuum and pressure cycle so that the pump will, uh, the pump will run. And Further down, let me, uh, let me do something here. Uh, 
So I'm going to show you something else here on the dashboard that you see. All right. Now, further down the screen, it gives you data on each well. So well number one, it tells you the total number of cycles that that well has, uh, has operated, its runtime uh, in hours. And then underneath that, you see uh, this little uh, uh, circular uh, screen or the display here. This tells you what the, if you put your mouse over the, uh, the inner, uh, the green um, stripe, it tells you what the vacuum is currently set at. They got the vacuum set at 20 seconds, the pressure set at two minutes, and the delay is set at 40 minutes. So that particular well um, is set up so that it cycles every 40 minutes. And when it cycles um, for 20 seconds, it will draw product into the into the pump. And then after that 20 seconds has elapsed, um, there's a um, solenoid valve with a plunger that switches. So the compressor provides pressure to the pump to pump the product to the surface and it pumps for 40 seconds before it goes into the delay and then delays for 40 minutes. The way the system operates, because we're operating eight wells, it will go through and cycle, when you first turn it on, cycle all eight wells. Then after it's done cycling all eight wells, it will look for the well that has the shortest delay left, because we're only running one well at a time. This is a solar power system uh, with the compressor built into the control panel. It runs one well at a time, so it will look for the well with the shortest delay left and go to that well. And right now that well is well number three, uh, according to the uh, dashboard. And once well number three cycles, let's see what its settings are. We have 20 seconds in the vacuum, two minutes on the pressure, and the delay is at two and a half hours. So after that two and a half hours is elapsed on well number three, and it cycles, it goes through its vacuum and pressure cycle. Once it's finished with that vacuum pressure cycle, it will again look for the next well that has the shortest delay left. Because they're all counting down at the same time, but they have different settings because they have different levels of product in the well. And so that information that you see on the screen here is for all, all eight wells. So you take a look at, uh, you know, they each have different number of cycles because they have different, different delay settings. So it all depends on what the product recharge rate is in that particular well, how often they want that well to cycle. So now we'll go over to, we'll click on the status screen. This screen is telling us um, indication of uh, any of the uh, alarms. particular site, again, is operating eight wells, and instead of uh, pumping everything into one recovery tank, each well has its own recovery tank and own uh, high-level tank hole switch. So up here is telling you that the, the, if there's no faults, there's no alarms, um, our uptime is up to 14.8 days, and the temperature on the board, uh, 84 degrees. Our voltage, our, panel, our battery is fully charged. The total number of cycles for all eight wells since this system got put online, 23,000. Um, the total number of tank full alarms that they've had has been 20 out of all eight tank holes over, over the period of time that this site's been up. Um, and then the holding tanks here will tell you the status of each one of those tank holes. And there's eight, eight tank holes, and right now they're all, the, the tanks are not full. So the system is up and running. Uh, the way we set this system up, or the way that we designed it, was if uh, tank number one is full and it shuts, it will only shut off well number one. The other seven wells will still continue to operate. So rather than turn the entire system off, it's only shutting off well number one. And when that happens, uh, you know, you'll get a tech, the technician will get a text message. He'll, he'll know that tank or that well number one is in tank full alarm. So when he gets to the site, he knows he needs to go to that, um, that particular um, recovery well. So you have this information here for all eight recovery wells. Um, it shows, uh, this screen here says that it's enabled. Um, you can actually, uh, with with the remote monitoring, you can shut off a particular well if for some reason there's something wrong with the pump or that well is not producing uh, any product anymore. Rather than cycle that well, you can disable that well so that it skips over that well and just cycles the other seven. Or you can do it for multiple wells. So 
I click on the alert screen here. Um, what this screen is, uh, um, is for is basically you can name the type of alarm here. Uh, in this case, it would be a tank bolt, but uh, they haven't named it. Um, and what the what the trigger uh, so the trigger a system alarm and it only triggers if the condition um, has changed. In other words, the, the tank will float is down, but when it changes so that it's up, it means the tank is full is when it will trigger the alarm and send the message out. And here are the different emails for the different uh, contacts that uh, um, at the company um, that will get a text message uh, when that happens. And uh, you can also set what the uh, notification rate is. In other words, you can set it so that uh, uh, it'll alarm, send a message every hour until someone goes and fixes the problem, or you can just do it so it's daily. Oh, please come on in. And you can do this for, again, they got they have this set up for up to eight wells. Let's go back to the dashboard. Over on the uh, left hand side, um, you got your devices, which is basically um, the, um, the cover page um, that you see when you turn the, um, when you log into the system. It's giving you the, uh, the, what the last activity was. In this case, it was three minutes ago, um, that one of the wells cycled. Um, it's telling you if there's any faults or alarms um, and the status of the, uh, of the radio. Right now, they're online. Um, if it was offline, you would see that here, and you know that there's either something going on with the cell phone signal at that site, or maybe something happening with the uh, with the modem itself. Then over on the left-hand side, um, underneath that, for managed users, this is where you can change the person that's actually uh, um, receiving notifications when things go into alarm, or they, they have access to the site. Uh, to actually log in and see what's going on. There are um, rules for admin. Uh, admin has full um, full functionality with this system. They can go in and make changes to the site, um, or a user that can just go in and just monitor what's going on. They can't make any changes. Okay, and finally, you can go over to the settings and for those of you that were, that were here for the earlier um, presentation I gave on the, on the SIPR system itself, there's a four button keypad on the front of the control panel that you can go in and make changes to the vacuum pressure and delay settings. Uh, you just hit the keys um, to increase the amount of time you want for each one of those timers. With the telemetry, you can actually go in and do that remotely from your desk. So you can set it up for each one of the wells. Um, just for an example, well number one, they've got it set at 20 seconds for the vacuum, uh, 120 seconds for the pressure, and then 24. And this is all in seconds here. 2400 seconds on the delay, which is uh, whatever it was, two and a half hours or 40 minutes, I think, on well one. Yeah, 40 minutes on well one. So you would do that with each one of those. And then here's the screen where you would actually go in and you would change um, if you want to shut well number one off. You would unclick that box so well number one is no longer enabled. Then you, uh, when you're done, you uh, just upload the uh, information and it will uh, make the change. Conditions change where well number one is not producing product like it was uh, earlier or a few months ago. You can go in and make the changes here rather than have someone travel to the site and stand in front of the control panel with the uh, keypad and do it there. You can do it from, from your office. Any questions? What about the inspect tab? The inspect tab. With remediation, I'm not sure that one is being used. Okay. 
right now we're not using that one with uh, with the zipper with the zipper telemetry. You can though, and if um, if you want to graph any parameter, whatever this is connected right. to, if, if, flow meter, right? Right. If there's a flow meter you put on there, or any other uh, a transmitter type device, uh, pressure or whatever, um, you can choose to log it, and and you can look at the graphs and, and monitor that data or download the data. Any other questions? You see sites that you could do something like this on? I know what I showed you here was for a product recovery system, but we also had this set up for like an SVE and air storage uh, application where you would have either uh, like a CFM transmitter or a pressure transmitter. Um, that you can monitor and actually let's see, I think we have a, uh, a site here that we, uh, yes, this one right here. Okay. This particular site is actually in New York State as well. It's at Brooklyn, New York. They have two um, SVE systems, so they extraction systems, um, and one a controller for each one of them. Uh, and same thing, you can go in and monitor uh, what's going on with that site. Uh, and with this one, they actually have a fault right now. Uh, the SVE is in a high vacuum condition, so it has shut the blower down, um, and so the customer would have gotten a, a, a text notification. They just haven't gone to the site yet to get the system back online. But again, you get uh, runtime uh, indication, uh, the number of cycles uh, that the system is turned on and turned off. Um, they don't have any transmitters hooked up to this particular system at, at, uh, at this time, but if they did, you would be able to, be able to go in and look at uh, what the CFM is uh, at any particular time or what their pressure was at any particular time or vacuum in this case. Any questions online, Brian? I asked nobody had any. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you again. Thanks for coming. I've got business cards up here, so if you think of something, uh, you know, uh, whenever, um, you can contact me directly. I am based in New Hampshire. Um, I'm not here at the Denver office. Um, I sell the remediation equipment uh, uh, for Geotech, so anything remediation-wise comes through me. Well, good morning. Uh, appreciate you all coming. Uh, I'm Dave Rich with Geotech Computer Systems. And uh, it's a different company from what we call the other geotech, which is geotech environmental equipment. Uh, we do software for managing environmental needs. So I'm going to talk not so much about our software, but about the process of managing environmental data uh, and how it can be gathered, managed, used on projects, and so on. And I'll make a particular shout out to our, our folks online that are watching. Uh, welcome here. And. Um, so I'm going to go through some slides and I'll leave some room at the end for um, people that have questions uh, or whatever, or don't hesitate to shout out a question you know, in the middle of it. If I say something dumb, take me to task for it. Um, so we'll kind of go that way. And then hopefully I can move the slides with this thing. So we'll start out with uh, kind of a high level view of the process uh, of gathering, managing and using the data, uh, setting up a database, uh, managing, hello, managing field events um, uh, and the data management implications of that. And then, um, uh, hello, it's not hidden very well, I'll just do this. You gotta push the button hard on that. Push it hard? Yeah. <laughs> I know how to do that. Somebody got a rock hammer? I know how to do that. All right, so, um, well, that one kind of. All right, um, and then importing the data, and that's a big part of it. You know, can you get the data in a format that you can use and uh, get it uh, uh, into the database in a way that I think would do something useful with it? And um, 
uh, data review and validation. Of course, this varies tremendously based on the kind of data, but uh, some projects require very stringent uh, data validation guidelines, EPA, CLP level three type data validation, checking your holding times and spike recoveries and valid detection and things like that. And then um, selecting the data so that you can get out just the data you want. You got 12 million records in there. You don't want to necessarily have to bring them all up on the screen at one time. So uh, what do I want today? Just groundwater. Um, and then once you've chosen the data you want, formatting it, and it's it's more than just do I want you know a table or a list or something, but it's things like how do I want to handle my non-detects, uh, that kind of thing. And then we'll go into that in a little more detail. And then what kind of output you're going to have, what sorts of displays. Is it going to be a graph or a map or a table or whatever? And related to that is the mapping and GIS. We'll talk a little bit about what you need to do sort of from the data side to be able to do that. And more and more companies are making that a big part of what they deliver to their clients. Another thing that's becoming more and more uh, popular is data portals. Uh, there might be a reason why uh, you need to present the data either to a public, the public, or a larger audience uh, in-house in the company, or your customers, or whoever it is. Um, and then uh, business justification for this: Does it make sense to implement a data management system instead of losing Excel files? So it kind of comes down to what you what your needs are, whether it's worth it or not. So here's that high-level view of the process, and. Uh, so it starts out with planning the sample events. Are you going to have a one-time sample event, like we're taking soil borings? There's going to be ongoing uh, sample event, event, like monitoring wells or something like that. Um, and then you're going to need to enter the locations. If you're going over and over again, you can need the locations of where you're taking the samples, or you may know that ahead of time for a one-time event. Um, and then um, uh, once you've uh, done that, you create your container labels and, and change the custody. And then you go out in the field, uh, you do your sampling. Um, and then if there's field data, water levels, pHs, you're going to enter those presumably out in the field. On the lab, uh, they make uh, they analyze your samples and send the result to you in an electronic deliverable format or something like that. And then uh, you've got to bring it into the database and check it one way or another. And that could go uh, from just to get in there, does it look right, to full validation, uh, completeness checks, and things like that. And that's tied into where the database is. So down at the bottom, we have database with a structure that's designed to take the kind of data that you're going to give it. So uh, site, uh, a site is typically like a project, a facility, something like that, or a watershed. Uh, stations would be your locations, your soil borings, monitoring wells, surface water locations. Samples would be typically physical samples, but it could be just an observation event. We went out there to water level or something like that. And then the analyses are the results, and they could be chemical analyses, like how much benzene or arsenic. They could be uh, physical measurements, like uh, depth of water or turbidity. Um, they could be biological measurements. So, you know, what's the uh, genus and species of this fish we caught, or these bugs that are in this bucket of muck that we gathered. Um, and then that's tied into a bunch of lookup tables, uh, which is things that uh, constrain the data in these tables. So you want to make sure, for example, if you put in a station that you know the station type. Is it a monitoring well? Is it a soil barn? What is it? Um, parameters, though, is the big one, which is uh, EPA calls them characteristics. I wish we'd actually use that word. It's a better word. But uh, in the lab, it would be analytes. In the field, it would be field parameters. Uh, but then those are tied to the analyses table um, so that you can only get analyses that uh, that relates to the parameters that you have. A good example is we did a project a little while back at uh, AFP44 in Tucson. They had to pull together the data from several different databases. The project database at the Air Force Base. They're right next door to the airport. They had a database. The state had a database. And in the meantime, the plume is moving towards the well field out to the west of the airport. And so uh, they were tasked with bringing all these databases together and figuring out what was going on there. We helped them with that. And it ended up being quite a large database. But the data we got from the state had about 10,000 records for which there was no matching record in the parameters table. So we knew it was 50,000 of something, but we didn't know what it was 50,000 of. Well, that's pretty useful. And they spent a lot of money to gather this data, and then somebody screwed up this link right here, and we don't know what it is. Um, and then uh, what are you going to do with it? Analyze and display the data. So you're going to choose the data you want. Uh, choose your display options. Do I want to compare to regulatory limits, whatever? Uh, choose your output format and then generate your output, whatever that's going to be. So that's the purpose of it. No purpose in spending $100,000 on a sampling program and then just you know, put it in a drawer. Uh, you want to get some use out of it. And then um, 
the benefit, of course, is that it, all the data is in one location. So it's not like who has the latest Excel file, something like that. You know, people ask me, selling software like this, what's your biggest competitor? My answer is Excel. I think more people are using Excel to manage environmental data than all of the commercial data management applications combined. So, um, and you know, people set in their ways. But you can't lose the forest from the trees. I mean, getting it out and looking at it and using it is the purpose of it. You look at the data structures and uh, look up tables and value value lists and all that kind of stuff. But what really matters is the capability of getting out and using uh, to make decisions on your, on your project. And uh, so first of all, you got to set up the database. I, I talked a little bit about the lookup tables, which constrain the data in the main tables at all the levels, station samples, analyses, uh, and then other things, regulatory limits, uh, uh, bulk data would be things that aren't really samples and analysis, like a, a downhole push or a time sequence data set or something like that. And so here, for example, we're setting up the regulatory limits, you might call them MCLs or target levels or whatever you want to call it. And um, uh, so you start out with your uh, regulatory limit types, and there's, it could be whatever, you know, depending on what your project needs. You've got federal standards, state standards, uh, risk-based residential, risk-based industrial, whatever. Um, and then underneath the standards, uh, the types are the limits themselves. So here we have four different MCLs for arsenic and water. Um, and of course, you're gonna, they're gonna be different for each matrix uh, as well. So this is soil, water, groundwater, surface water. And, um, and then you're gonna manage your field events. So here we're setting up to go out in the field. We're gonna take some samples at MW1 and MW3. These are gonna have the QC. Uh, we're going to uh, take some soil samples uh, at one location. It's gonna be uh, uh, by deck. And you set this up ahead of time, and then you tell the software, uh, I want to, for example, make my um, uh, uh, container labels. Uh, so it makes you know, one for each, whether it's a bottle or a bag or whatever you have. Um, and then the chain of custody, which matches, of course, the, the container labels. And so you print some of these out. One goes in the cooler, one goes with the shipping documents, one goes in the log book, or whatever. And then you got to bring the data in. So you're going to have to tell it a format you want to use. Um, and, Obviously, there's a lot of different ways that it can have to come in. Um, and then uh, uh, you, you choose your file, and you answer a bunch of questions about how it's going to go in. And then a big, a big part of the, the management of this kind of data is enforcing consistency within the database. So uh, here, for example, we're importing a file that it has at this facility called Refining Inc. It has a station, MW14, that's not in the station state. Now, at this point, we could add a station. We could add all the stations. We could add an alias. But here it is. It just has a dash in it. Well, if you don't keep that consistent on the way in, you're going to lose it on the way out. So you go to do a graph and some of your locations are going to be missing. So software is trying to do two things. It's trying to um, improve the quality of the data by <coughs> uh, get it, making the data that you get from your data provider uh, as good as you got it or improve it. And then the second one is easily overcome or avoid common problems. So we're doing both of those here. We've got an error. Whoops. Hello. Um, we've got an error and we're telling it what to do to fix it. So we're getting good data in, even though we started with data that wasn't quite so good. And then it's just telling us here, um, you know, all the data was handled successfully. I call that the happy stream. Um, and then uh, here it's just telling us what happened. You know, the defensibility of the data is a big thing in a lot of projects. So what happened? Where was your, where was your data last night? And uh, you know, this is kind of just helping you with those sorts of things. Um, and then, uh, like I said, on some projects, you have to do uh, various levels of data review, data review all the way up through uh, CLP type data validation. And so you're going to do things like you know, check your field duplicate RPDs, um, and then you're going to flag it if it fails, uh, whether it's a detected value or a not detected value. Um, and then uh, you're also going to want to store a reason code for why it failed. And in a lot of cases, the reason the uh, codes will be the same. Uh, you know, maybe it's a, it's a, a J, it's estimated, or a UJ, it's a non-detect estimated, and there's various reasons why I could have that. Other people will say, I, I don't want just a J, I want a J1, J2, J3. So everybody has their own different way of doing it. Um, and then, um, in this case here, the software has gone in and figured all that out. And here's here's the flags that it made, these are all detections, um, and then the, the things that it failed, this one actually failed two of the tests here. So, and then it's up to the, uh, the validator and the project staff to determine Purpose of validation is to determine suitability for use, so it's a judgment call. A software can't do that. It does the calculations for you, tells you what it finds, finds, and then it's up to the project staff to uh, make decisions about how to use it. So this is an example of an output for something like that. And uh, there's questions that uh, you can put in, and then you just tell the software the answer to it. And then there's also 
uh, things that the software knows because you ran the validation and fills that part out for you. So you make this checklist and use it as the end result of the between qualifying the data in the database and then giving this to whoever cares um, is the, the purpose of the validation. And I've noticed over the years I've been doing this, it's becoming more and more important. Uh, more and more projects are requiring at least some level of validation. Maybe it's validate 10% or at least check the holding times or whatever it is that they need to do. All right, so then once we've made our database, we want to, um, to get it out. Obviously, that's the purpose of it. Um, so we're going to go in and tell it what data we want. So here, for example, we're saying at the station level, I want two monitoring wells. I want a range of dates. In this case, I just want sulfate. I clicked on update and it tells me I have five analyses that fit these criteria. And then I tell it how I want to display my data. So um, I've got uh, a bunch of options here for things like uh, how to handle your flags. Like uh, if I have a U flag, which means non-detect, do I want to show the most common would be less than in the detection, less than 1.00. In Florida, Florida DEP wants the detection limit followed by the U flag. And so every flag can have its own way of being rendered. If it's an R flag because you rejected it, you probably don't want to show anything but the flag. You don't want to show it all. So you set all this up sort of on a flag by flag basis and a lot of other things. You know, how do I want to handle do I want commas in large numbers or I'm working in South America, I want dots in the large numbers, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you generate your output. There's a you know, huge number of different ways of doing it. A lot of them uh, have to do with things like comparing to regulatory limits. We'll see some more of this uh, in a minute. Or this is a, a graph that lets you look at uh, concentration of constituents uh, as a function of groundwater elevation. So groundwater is going up and down through the seasons. What's benzene doing? Or a nap or whatever. And then here, a lot of people want some kind of a table or other of their data. I want samples across, parameters down, or vice versa. So that's what we're doing here, is we're um, uh, going to say, I want, uh, across the top, I want the station name and the sample date. Uh, down the side, I want the parameter name and the units. In the middle, I want this formatted value and flag, less than 1.00 or 6.7 BJ, or whatever. There's lots of other things that you can tell it. Then this is the end result. And for, uh, I've been told in our system, about 80% of the data comes out of the bio data in one of these cross-tab wizard output formats, because this seems like the main thing that people want. Now, there's only one right way, and it's different for everybody. So here we have a samples across cross-tab, but other people will say, no, I need my parameters across. So you just tell the software how you want it. Again, here's our value and flag information. There's my uh, less than the detection limit. I've got uh, somewhere I have a BJ flag in here. I forget exactly where it is. And then um, we also have over here uh, four different maximum concentration levels. Uh, these all happen to be upper levels. They could be upper or lower if it's pH or something. Um, and then um, it's just color coding them based on which of these it fails. And actually, uh, we're using a background color. You can only do one background color, but you can do a background color, foreground color, bold, italics, underline, anything like that. So I've got my data in here. Now I want to make reports like this or graphs. I also want to make some maps. So I'm going to go to my GIS and start making some maps. So what do you need to do that? Obviously, you need some kind of a base map or image. And that's real easy now. Um, the base maps uh, and images especially are available from lots of different sources, uh, from Google Maps. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has great imagery for all around the country. Uh, lots of places you get that stuff. And you need locations uh, for your points. And for something like a monitoring well, typically you just look at the XY, the easting and northing of the, the collar or whatever you're measuring from there. Uh, and then, uh, of course, down the hole, you may be interested in, in depth or elevation or something like that. Um, but you have to have that. And um, old data sets, that can be a real problem. Now, they may not have surveyed that location. You know, it's somewhere uh, out in South 40. Or um, well, we did a project years ago where uh, Steve remembers this one. West Chicago, the original 00, zero was where the railroad used to cross the creek. So, you know, those are the things that you have to deal with when you go back into those bad old days. Um, they have to match. Um, a lot of times you'll see uh, you've got a base map and then you put your locations on it, it's over in the other county. But what does that mean? You know, one of them's in State Plain and one of them's in UTM or, or whatever it is. So you got to get all that stuff straightened out so it shows up in the right place. And um, then uh, there's GIS software. Most people in environmental use ArcGIS. Still a lot of people use the AutoCAD, which is, isn't really a GIS, but it makes maps. Um, and there's specialized software to make environmental specific displays, which could be either in the GIS or it could be a separate program like uh, 
surfer or uh, rock works or something like that, all good programs. But integration between the EDMS and the GIS can save a lot of time and improve quality uh, so that you sort of you put the data in one time, you make your tables, you make your graphs, and make your maps, and if it all comes from the same source, then it's going to match, which is pretty important. Because if you make a mistake between the map and the table, who's going to find it? The client is going to find it. So then all of a sudden now you look bad. <clears throat> so here's just an example. This is in GIS, and um, uh, the user has made a table of uh, some data by depth. These happen to be uh, radiolog. Oops, go back. Stop. Stop. <sighs> Helps to push your right button. Um, you know, so these are uh, you know by depths and their their values. Um, and you can see we have some exceedances here, so they've been color coded. Now, there's another example in GIS. They've uh, uh, chosen to show the uh, uh, c contaminant concentration here in one track and the lithology in another track. And um, I worked on a project a while back where um, it's going to cost a lot of money to dig it all up and take it to Utah. And so we helped them make some displays like this, and they found out it was in glacial till, and they found out that all the high values were in the fines, uh, sills and clays. So they bought industrial log washers, they washed the rocks, put them in the backfill, and set the silts and clays and saved 90% of what they thought was going to be a billion dollars. So they didn't give it to me, though. I don't understand. Should have. Um, well, here we're doing time sequence data on the map. So we're seeing how these wells have been doing over time. And to me, this type of display shows so much more than putting up a table and saying, look, over here is this and this and this and this. One. You look at that, oh, look at that, man. A consultant's doing a great job. Uh, it's going down, or whatever it is. Our 3D displays. Now, this is no longer in GIS. We've gone into a, a program called Voxler from Golden Software. And um, so we're showing uh, a couple of plumes uh, in 3D out there. And um, they look like they're floating above the site, but um, I found that it's easier to put them above the site because the site, the, the, the base image is kind of opaque. So if I put them underneath it, you wouldn't see it. So you got to bear with me on that. But what do they call it on the cock shows? Willful suspension of disbelief uh, at times when you're making your displays here. So um, anyway. Um, a new one that's, that's becoming more and more important is uh, data portals. People are wanting to do more with their data. We spent 100 grand on that sampling program, and now the neighbors want to know what we found. And, um, and so that's something that we've been helping our clients with. Um, uh, a large number of users, whether it's the public or your clients or project managers within your organization. Um, and um, so you have to build a database, obviously. You've got to put this stuff in a place where you can, can have it organized and find it and you know things like consistent units and all that. you got to have all that stuff figured out before you can even start to think about making a map or, or even a list. Uh, so then you set up a website uh, for data selection and display. Um, and arrange for appropriate security. If it's a public website, you don't need security. If it's like for your clients and you want to make sure that your client goes to this portal, they can only see their data and not their competitor's data or whatever it is. So the issues like that, you got to pay attention to. And yeah, you know, anytime you involve the web, uh, there's a whole nother level of issues that you have to deal with, especially in the security area. We had one client that uh, we're storing all their data up in the cloud, Microsoft Windows Azure. And um, they called us up one morning and they said, uh, our site just became dog slow. I mean, we used to click it, it would just come right up. Now we click it, we wait, 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 wait. So one of our techs went behind the scenes and it turned out they were suffering from what's called a distributed denial of service attack, DDoS. And what it is, is it's um, people uh, take over computers like yours and they install software on it so that at a certain time, they all try to go to your website. And so you, you get a, a website that's used to 10 users and 100,000 people are hitting on it every second. It just can't handle it. And um, fortunately, the, the Azure security that we had set up there, they didn't get in, but they just slowed it down so it was unusable. But then eventually, once they realized that you know, after millions of hits, they weren't getting in, they went did, did it somewhere else. So an hour later, it was just fine. But those are the kind of things you have to pay attention to. The more you make it available to the world, the more you're at risk to the world. We all know there's bad, crazy people. And then, of course, you take what the data is in the database and provide it to the website. A lot of times it's done with what's called a data mark. So you select the data out of the database. You maybe got 1.2 million records, but you only want to put out the groundwater data. Um, so you don't have to search through all the other data to bring it up on a map. Um, so you'll make a data mark and then put that behind uh, the website. So here's an example. Uh, looks actually kind of similar to the select data form on the desktop software. 
uh, where we have the site station samples, uh, well, uh, sample groups, uh, dates, uh, depths, and, and then, of course, uh, parameters or summary categories, something like that. So the user chooses what they want to see, and then they choose the kind of output they want. Here's an example of a, uh, of a table that they're making. To, uh, and of course, this point you can uh, copy to the clipboard, paste it into Word or Excel or something like that. Um, or you can make a map. Uh, this happens to be a, a public data set from uh, Miami-Dade County. Uh, and uh, this is one of their landfills. And so we brought this up. The map came from Google Maps. Um, and so basically, you get, we paid them $12 to license Google Maps for all of our clients. And we, unless we get more than like a, a thousand hits a day, we don't get any additional charges, which these, these projects are not like that. Um, so we basically get all the maps and air photos. You can click up at the top and go to satellite um, and, uh, and put that over the top of it. But it makes it kind of hard to see. Um, and then they've clicked on one of the locations and it's showing the data down at the bottom. For it. So you set this up uh, for whoever, for you or your client or whoever it is, um, and then they can publish this address. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. What they're going to do is um, when they deliver their report to the state, they're going to give them the formal report and then they're going to give the state a web address to this place and the state can decide whether they're going to use it themselves or publish it to the public and we don't know yet what they're going to do but uh, more and more uh, people want accountability uh, especially on public projects um, and this is for that so why would you want to do all this stuff i'm putting my sales on tab on. okay so decrease overhead we had a client um, they saved about 12,000 a year on one project because they moved the data management tasks to a less experienced clerical person. Instead of having a, a $100 an hour um, bachelor's person doing it, uh, they would give it to a clerical person. And importing the data, as long as you know what you're doing and you pay attention, is not that difficult. So they saved a lot of money. Another client, um, they would look at their data, and every year um, they would determine some wells that they could either shut down or go from quarterly to annual or something like that and save a lot of money over the years because that's cumulative as they shut them down. They probably had to put in more, but anyway, so they saved a lot of money um, just doing that. Uh, the big one, though, is increasing the efficiency um, to uh, a time to process electronic deliverable. Uh, one client was, we were working with it used to take 30 minutes to get the Excel file, and make sure it had the right name on it, put it in the right folder and do all that kind of stuff just to get it to the point where they could start doing it. Um, it took them a half an hour. They got a, a good system. It took them five minutes. And I was telling somebody earlier today, uh, we got we had a company uh, that got Enviro data going in India. It was a Honeywell, big company, and they had a consulting group in India where they figured they could make their reports cheaper over there than hiring folks like you all to do it over here. So they bought our software and they got it up and running. And I was talking to one of their guys after they did that, and in his beautiful Indian accent, he said to me, "I love it because now I can take a day off on my day off." So that's the goal of this, is to be able to cut down the wasted time on these projects. Now, years ago when I started doing this, 20, 30 years ago, they would say, my manager doesn't want that because they want me to get the billable hours. So I talked to them a couple of years later and said, yeah, that company went out of business. So I went to work for the competitor that is trying to keep their costs down. Well, yeah, your clients are stupid. Well, maybe some are, but most are. Uh, we had an, uh, a Native American tribe. i got to change the slide. Uh, what, need to make 900 graphs per year for their EPA project manager. A guy called me up and said, my project manager is driving crazy. She wants me to graph all my data. I said, well, that's not a problem. I have it all in the database now. Um, but he said, you don't understand. Every location, every parameter, 900 graphs. It took me three months to do it last year in Excel. So I fired up a WebEx. It was WebEx back then. And I showed him how to select all his data. And um, he made a graph, uh, a report, Nine graphs per page, 100 pages, and printed it to a PDF in 10 minutes. So that's probably, your mileage may vary, but that's probably the best I'll ever get is three months down to 10 minutes. Um, also, we had clients that uh, made data management, I shouldn't have my name here, had made data management a product that they sold to their clients. So um, they, would, they would say, just, you know, we'll take up all of it and we'll just give you all the output. Some people do that already, but other people made that a whole branch of their organization was uh, adding revenue by doing this. So they became maybe the data management group on a project where other people were out in the field and other people were doing other things, but they were able to get a chunk of it by, um, by automating this and doing it more effectively. So environmental investigations, uh, and remediations are becoming, are, they're inherently complex um, and implementing a centralized data management system makes sense.
for most environmental projects, not necessarily all. If you've got one well, Excel's going to do just fine. Uh, but if you've got 100 wells, you're going to be in trouble. Integrating validation with data management, the great to reduce the cost and improve quality, if you have to do that, uh, is a time to retire your spreadsheet. Now, we're from our commercial sponsor, and I'll take uh, any questions. Questions? Going once? Going twice. Okay, well, well uh, let's see then. Um, I'll tell you a joke since I got one more minute. So, um, I had a couple of friends in the environmental business. Um, and one was a geologist and one was an engineer. And they were dating, but it didn't work. It just didn't work out because there just wasn't the chemistry. Uh, and now, if any of you have kids, I got one for them. Um, what do cats eat for breakfast? Mice Christmas. <laughs> Thank you all. All right. Um, so um, we're going to talk about a, a device um, that measures groundwater velocity and how you could use that in uh, for remediation project is uh, well you can find out how fast the flu could be migrating and in what direction. Um, so uh, that's kind of the overall topic that we're talking about today. Um, this particular device, uh, I'm gonna show you how it works and, and you can imagine how to use it. Um, so um, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna we're going to do um, a bucket test. So we're going to demonstrate this equipment and how it works by making this graph. So you can see here on this graph that there, um, there's a, the red lines are the direction. So um, we're going to we're going to swirl uh, water in a bucket and we're going to make it go in a direction and we're going to measure how uh, fast it's going. The blue lines are the speed of the particles that are going to be uh, mapped by the software. Um, and you can see as the uh, water in the bucket slows down, it will naturally attenuate its speed. And that's what that slope looks like as it slows down. The top is the maximum speed, and then it slows down to the bottom. Um, so we'll get that demonstration started, and then we'll talk about some application. I'll move this here. Yeah, so, uh, water start up. So right now I'm just swirling the water in the bucket to get it going all in one direction. So I, I swirled it clockwise and now I have the um, probe here on the south end of the bucket so the water should be going to the west. So we set up this software. This is the Aqualite software. Um, here, and we're going to start a new file, and you're going to want to name it something intelligible. This is the cafeteria for field day. Depth, you're going to want to note the depth that you're sampling at. We'll get into some of those details uh, along with the presentation. We're going to say we're at 50.5 feet. And these are just data entry points. Um, and magnetic declination, we're just going to leave it zero, but you could look that up for where you're at. There's a compass in here, and you'll want to correct for your magnetic declination for where you're at in the world. You can save it in a location. So part of this whole thing is staying organized with your data. Uh, if you're in the last presentation with Dr. Dave, uh, you know how important that is. And very important step. Could you speak a little bit louder? Yes. Sure. And I'll try not to talk to the wall. <laughs> Let me get going in here real quick. That's right, as long as you talk louder. Yeah, yeah. All right, so now we've got the preview screen down here in the bottom, and that's actually the microscope view of the water. 
So you can see those little particles traveling across the screen. Those are um, in a in a groundwater well. Those will be colloids, um, neutrally buoyant particles in the groundwater. And that's okay. This compass can be working, or we'll just ignore it. Um, we will just. Do it in life, folks. Hang tight. We're gonna have to go to device manager. Six. Six? Six. Anybody? Any other guesses? We're going for six. Going for six. We're gonna have to go to device manager. That's okay. So you get a good demonstration of how the equipment works. Also not plugged in. That should help. Com five. Okay. That's going to go much better. Showing the um, the heading on the compass, showing the orientation of the of the probe itself. So if I turn it, you can see the compass is changing its heading, um, and that's how it's going to know um, which direction the particles are traveling in. So the image of uh, the particles here would be uh, oriented to north, as if there was a compass paper uh, where the north um, is the red north? Um, so, excuse me. What are the what are the parallel lines in the bottom of the figure? That's just part of the video. Oh, okay. they, they don't really have anything to do with it. Um, so, we'll start tracking, and then we'll we'll move to the uh, presentation for a few minutes. That took too long. That's screwed back up. All right, so now it's tracking the particles. Um, they're moving pretty fast. So now the graph is populating with data. The red dashes are the direction, and the uh, black splotch is the velocity, um, or the speed, rather. And, and then together, those are velocity, so vector. All right. So um, this is the this is graph we're going to build. Um, so on the left is the direction, and that's uh, zero to three hundred sixty degrees. Uh, this graph should start populating at around two hundred seventy degrees um, as it travels west, as those particles are moving west, um, and the speed will slowly uh, change and reduce. Um, so, what is groundwater velocity? Seems like an obvious question, but uh, we get it all the time. Um, it's the direction and the speed of the groundwater. So, um, typically relatively slow. Um, so this is something you definitely want to keep in mind when you're doing this kind of uh, investigation is it's an hydrogeologic time scales. Not as slow as geologic time scales, but still quite slow. Um, 
you can have very, very low um, flow rates, which we'll get into here. So um, here's an example. This is, is uh, a range of groundwater velocities here on the front range that we've found. Um, 0 0.0005 to 0 0.09 feet per day. So I don't really have a concept of 0 0.0005 feet per day. Um, so we have to kind of change those units around so they, they're comprehensible for us. And so we can also plan our time in the field. Um, so if you, if you convert those units to micrometers per second, um, it's also another incomprehensible number to begin with. Um, but 0 0.08 micrometers per second is, is it's, we're getting there. We're almost the whole numbers. Um, so we'll try it again and we'll go for, for a minute. So we're going to multiply again um, to get uh, 0 0.12 or 4, and 4.8 uh, micrometers per minute. The low end, as I say here, is still too small. Uh, what we want to get to is something we can really think about. So um, 1.2 micrometers per 100 minutes is going to be like a scalable thing. Um, and then a rule, good rule of thumb is to do six times your base units per sample. So in this case, to measure that low end flow for a statistically valid sample or six times your base time, it's going to take 600 minutes. So you're going to want to know that because it's going to take 600 minutes to get one sample. So um, this is probably why you're here for this talk. Why would we measure groundwater velocity at the beginning? Well, for this talk in particular, you're going to want to characterize the plume travel of some contamination. Um, and so we're back to the to the devices. Let's see how we're doing tracking. Um, so it looks like um, that direction um, line is pop populating pretty nicely there at about uh, I must have the bucket turned a little bit or something, but we're just above 270 degrees. Um, so pretty much west. And you can see that speed has tapered down and that slope is now pretty low. So we can change it to a new a new position. And I'll just turn it 180 degrees. And then I'll stir up the water again. This is what you're going to want to do in your office or your field office before you go and use it in a borehole because you're going to you're going to want to be pretty comfortable with all these uh, operating parts. Um, make sure you know how the equipment works before you try to use it. So this should be turned at 180 degrees. This should be flowing to the east. Oh, good question. What's going on in the top left? Oh, uh, so that's the digital representation of the tracked colloids. So. Um, you can see here, in, in, you can see in the lower, the actual preview image of the video. Right. You can see the, the particles moving through. Um, and then you can see the digital, uh, that's, that's the software identifying the um, particles as the same, frame to frame. Um, yeah, now I'm kind of seeing that yeah. they do they should mirror be, each other. They should match uh, up. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. That's how you can tell the instruments working. Um, and it's, yeah, you have to be able to see that. Um, so um, we should be seeing particles traveling to the east. We'll come back to that in a minute and see how we do. So here's the system components. Um, you can see we have the laptop, which I'm working on here. Um, camera control unit here for everybody. And then we have a reel with cable on it, and then the instrument itself. And then within the instrument itself, there are some components, the compass, the connector, the camera, and a, and a microscope lens. And, a, and it's a backlit microscope. Uh, so those are the components that work together. Um, here are a whole bunch of questions that we usually get um, for um, groundwater velocity measurements. Um, 
So there's other ways to measure uh, groundwater velocity. You've probably heard of tracer tests are one way, and that's where you put a chemical or a dye or some type of um, material in the water, and you then go and you measure around with monitoring wells, and you see how much of that tracer material has showed up in other monitoring wells. Um, that's a that's a bulk measurement, so it's an average, and it and and it's the tracer materials aren't necessarily uh, influenced just by the flow of water. They can move tangential to um, the actual flow of the water, um, mostly through osmosis, but uh, uh, or osmotic properties. Um, paddle wheels. Um, you can imagine a paddle wheel type meter. These are used in a lot of water flow applications. Um, it doesn't translate well to a small monitoring well. It's pretty, it ends up being a pretty small mechanical device and it has a pretty high minimum velocity that is required to make it turn. Um, they're great for surface water where relatively low high rates are more typical, um, but not so good for groundwater velocity. It's a really small uh, velocity. Heat source um, uh, type probes, uh, they have a heater in the middle, uh, usually pointed out. Um, but uh, and they heat up the water and then they have an array of sensors around the heater. And as the water passes by the heater, it heats up the water and you can measure an increase in temperature on the sensor array. And you're limited in um, resolution by how many sensors you can fit in the array. And in a two inch well, it's, it's not that many. So um, you don't have really high, act, uh, high resolution. Um, also, you're adding, you're adding uh, energy to the water, which can change, uh, which can change its velocity. Uh, again, we're measuring very small flow rates. Um, what we really want to find is preferential flow. So you're not going to have a homogeneous. You might, but unlikely that you'll have a homogeneous flow in your well. That's great if you do, I suppose. But uh, what you're looking for is where. The dominant flow is going through the well. So if you have um, fractured rock, you want to find that fracture. So that's going to be the the representative flow of the water in the ground in that area. Can I ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> you have beads in the bucket. Hmm? You have neutrally buoyant beads in the, in the bucket or something? Uh, it's just it's actually the tap water has. Colloids already oh, okay. in it. Yeah. And, and what about in the, the well? In groundwater. Same, same, same stator. It's got neutral buoyant particles. particles in it. Yeah, yep. It, it, yeah, all groundwater does. I, I shouldn't say that. Some groundwater doesn't. Some groundwater <laughs> is so clean there are no colloids in it, but it's extremely rare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, did that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can see when I was stirring up the water in this one, you know, dust falls in that bucket and you can get some <laughs> other stuff in it. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of information on colloids in groundwater. Um, if you're interested in looking that up. Um, so here's another good question, and we already kind of started talking about it. Is how long should I log at each interval, or how long is it going to take to get a sample? So, if you have no other information on the well, the rule of thumb, which is a very casual rule of thumb, is start at 15 minutes, but you're really playing blind. Um, so, you're going to want to let each measurement collect for 15 minutes. It's not a very good way to do it. You really need some other information, like a well boring log. Uh, uh, or some other uh, camera information if you've scoped the well and you've seen the walls. Um, you really want to uh, have an idea where you're going. And we have an example that we'll walk through um, in a minute. What's the nastiest, what's the nastiest well profile I can ever measure? Um, I'm sorry, I don't, uh, I mean, the nastiest as far as like what contamination is in there? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
a water flood of the oil fields? Uh, yeah, it's used in the oil field pretty, pretty often. Um, I mean, that's the nastiest. I suppose if there was a chlorinated solvent involved, that would be nastier. Yeah. And certainly our customers do measure in those environments. Yeah. yeah. Um, you want to use a pressure sensor or a, or a water level meter to um, measure the level of the water in the well, because when you put this probe in the well, you're going to displace that amount of water and the water is going to heave. And you want to know that that's that heave has displaced and it's back to the nominal groundwater level. Um, it's also going to give you another piece of information. It's going to give you another good data point for um, how long you might need this to dwell to get a good measurement. So um, we'll, we'll go through that example too. Here's the example. Let's check back on the, uh, the logging real quick. All right. We've been logging for a little while. Doesn't look like I got the particles to move as fast on that last one, but we did get a good cluster there at the uh, about east direction. Um, my compass is a little off today, my mental compass. Um, this is all dependent on where I physically place this. Um, it really has nothing to do with the actual direction. So now we'll try to get them to go south. And we'll get another line on the graph there. All right. Now we can go back to this example. So um, this is a kind of made up example. Um, if we had a hundred foot well bore and the water table is at 45 feet and a 10 foot screened interval 50 to 60 feet. Well boring logs show mostly a clay with medium sand at 10 to 13 feet. Um, 55 to 57 and 90 to 100. There's also a gravel layer at 50 to 55. So where would we start boring in this log or, or in this portal? Um, you would definitely start at the top of the screen. <laughs> There's only one screen inside of the trick question. Um, at 50.5 feet, that would be a good place to start. Um, and then in this example, the water heaved um, half foot, and it took 20 minutes for that water to go back down to the normal groundwater level. So um, what would be a good sample interval for measurement at this elevation? Well, we know it took 20 minutes to get that water back to nominal groundwater level. So 20 minutes is a pretty good number. Um, and we're going to go at one foot increments. So if we're going 20 minutes every one foot, there's 10 measurements. It's going to be about four hours of field time to characterize, to profile that 10 foot screen interval. So, again, setting the expectations for your field deployment is really uh, important. So, um, here we will go and look and see where you can find the resources. Uh, if, if you want to learn more about this, go ahead. Wait for that browser to load. All right, everybody off Pinterest. I'll get up on the band. So this product's under groundwater level and flow. Geotech colloidal borescope. 
more information. And I go straight down here to downloads. So this equipment's been around for a long, long time. There's a whole bunch of white papers on it. Um, and you can cure your insomnia really easily with this load of information sometimes. Um, but what's what's really also quite useful is you can download the software here. So we'll go ahead and do that and we'll take a look at what's inside there. There's something that's really handy that comes along with this software. We built a data template that compiles the information um, for you. Um, we'll go back to this log and uh, we're getting some, let's see, what which direction should it have been going? I think it should have been going north. So yeah, we were pretty close. Um, so we'll go ahead and stop tracking. We can stop the preview. We can export the log data. We'll just go to the desktop. And then we can use this data template that we have built up. To import and look at this data. We just have a button. I'll click. Then we'll surf over to the desktop where we just save that. Where we just save that file, and you can see it automatically parses out that data. There's a date and time stamp, uh, direction and speed, number of points sequence. That's all good troubleshooting information. And we also built in a graph. So that's the graph we produced today here in the bucket. Um, you can see we did pretty good on the blue slopes compared to the reference model that we pulled up at the beginning. Um, so um, hopefully that gives you an idea of the equipment and how it works and how uh, the uh, data can be visualized. Of course, you can do a lot more data analysis. Um, and maybe you can even put the data into Dr. Dave's software and complete your groundwater model or your plume model. Um, so any, any questions? I know my presentation answered all the questions I can think of, so it's not very fair to ask for questions after that. But um, anything came up? Our questions, Guy left. Uh, John, any uh, any applications where this would be super useful? Or? Well, like you said, as far as uh, you know, uh, crew might be pretty in recovery well, our monitoring well. Yeah, and being pretty accurate about that. Those are expensive to put in. That's so good to know. If your if your plume's traveling one foot per day, and you have sixty days until you can put in the well, you better be sixty feet further than you thought you were gonna be. And also think you know, if it's moving in a certain direction, you know, you want to control the plume if it's uh, water pumps in a certain part of the Oh yeah, you could definitely you could definitely quality control your uh, your common depression in your area of influence uh, by putting this in a monitoring well nearby the remediation well. You could see if you were actually influencing the water towards the remediation well. Yeah. That would be a good application. All right, I think we might be huh? We might be running a little late. Um, let's start on time. Uh, any other questions? You can follow up. I'll be hanging out, having lunch soon.